Hey there, 7-7, uh, seven seven, autosomal traits. Oh, there we go. Uh, so far, everything we've been talking about had, well, just about everything we've been talking about kind of followed the idea that you had a dominant form of a gene and a recessive form of a gene. And so we used letters to represent it. Well, that means that all these traits were on what are called your autosomes, which are the chromosomes that you have out of the 46 uh, chromosomes. 44 of them are just your plain old regular chromosomes. Two of them are your what are called sex chromosomes, the ones to determine if you're a boy or a girl. So what we call autosomes are your chromosome, I, I should say these are in pairs. So these are pairs 1 through 22. Uh, once again, I hate my pen. So pairs 1 through 22, and these are just the ones that control your everyday features. What do you look like? What hair color? What eye color? What traits? The, your dominant and recessive traits? You know, that kind of stuff. So we refer to those types of traits as being autosomal traits because they are found on chromosome pairs 1 through 22. If they're not on those pairs, but they're on the 23 pair, the X and the Y chromosome, we call them sex-linked traits because they're found on your sex chromosomes. So autosomal traits are those that are found on your autosomes. Makes sense. And pretty much everything we've been doing so far was autosomal because we just represent autosome, autosomal traits with our letters. Big letter, little letter. Now, there are um, lots of diseases and disorders. Ugh, cat butt in my face that are um, we call autosomal dominant disorders or traits because you need a dominant gene in order to show it. So like dimples. You know how we said dimples? You needed a big D in order to represent dimples and the little d's mean that you don't have any dimples. So that is an autosomal dominant trait. It's on your autosome and it's dominant in order to express it. So dimples is, is, is an autosomal dominant trait. But a lot of times we use this to refer to diseases because if you have an illness of some sort, it's kind of good to know if it's dominant or recessive because that'll tell you how likely it is that your kids will also pass on this particular trait or that you will pass it on to your kids. So if it is an autosomal dominant disorder or trait, then if you are big D, big D, you show it, okay? So I'm gonna, I'll just put show if it'll let me write. There we go. So you have two dominants. So that means you definitely show it. If you're a big D and a little D like that, doesn't matter. You have the big D, which means that you show it, okay? But if you're little D, little D, well, then you don't show it. Okay, so there's a lot of diseases that are out there that are autosomal dominant diseases, and I gave you a couple of examples here. Huntington's disease is one um, that affects the muscles of, oh shoot, I totally forgot. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's a muscular disorder. Uh, neurofibromatosis, if you've ever heard of Elephant Man with the misshapen face and his body was all big and lumpy and stuff, uh, that's this disorder. And it causes these big tumors to grow all over your body, in your muscles, even on your bones cat and so um, so if you have it you can pass it pass it on to your kid excuse me cat I'm trying to get some work done here um, but if you're little d little d which everybody at school is we don't have it so it's good to be recessive because that means you don't have it achondroplasia is just a fancy name for dwarfism and so again if you're Big, big, you have it. Big, small, you have it. Small, small, you don't. So everybody of normal normal height, we're all small, small, which means we don't have it. Now here's what's kind of interesting with achondroplasia. Most of the little people that we see are heterozygous because the big, big is actually lethal. Um, most individuals do not survive even being uh, made to nine months old in, inside of their mom's womb. The baby usually dies inside of the uterus and then comes out. So most individuals, if you have two little people that are going to have babies, if the two big D's get together, then that's usually fatal for their child. So here is a picture showing how autosomal dominant works. 
So we have an affected father, and so he's got a bad gene and a good gene. So he's big, small. So here's a dad right here. And then we have mom, who's totally fine. So small, small. So if we do a Punnett square with big, small, big, small, small, we get half of the kids are going to be big, small. So these two kids right here, and they're going to have it. And we have two kids that end up small, small, and they're totally fine. So that can... If you know the Punnett squares, you can figure out the likelihood that your kids are going to also have that disorder. Now, if it's a recessive trait and you're autosomal recessive, the only way that you'll show it is if you're homozygous recessive. So here I've got two parents. And they fall in love, they get married, and they're pregnant, and uh, they find out that their child is going to have this thing called cystic fibrosis. And they go, that's weird. I don't have it. You don't have it. How come our kid has it? Well, that's because... If you have a dominant good gene, well, you're fine. You're totally normal. Mom has a dominant good gene. She's totally normal. But they each carry a recessive bad gene. So what happens in the Punnett square, I can get two of the good genes together. I can get a good gene and a bad gene together. So all the three of these kids are normal. But if I just so happen to get that those two little genes together, then I have a 25% chance of having a kid who has a disorder. So when you get married, you know it's kind of a good idea to look at your spouse's family history because that will give you a good idea as to what kinds of things you may be able to pass on. So cystic fibrosis is one example. We've talked about this one a lot, the one that clogs up all your um, air passageways and so on. And then we have this one called phenylketonuria or PKU. And that one is one that when you're born within the first like two hours, um, you doctors come in and start poking at your heel and squeezing blood out of you because this one has to do with uh, what you eat that everybody has this amino acid called phenylalanine that's where the phenyl part comes from in either breast milk or formula and so when the baby starts eating they cannot digest phenylalanine and it builds up inside of their body and causes brain damage so before you start feeding your kid it's kind of a good idea to know if they have this disorder and so when you're born there's about 12 different genetic tests that doctors do right away no matter what because they want to know from day one whether or not you have this disorder so they can start treating you right away. So when you have kids, that's the first thing they do is they take some blood and figure out uh, what genetic disorders that your children may or may not have. And if they know you do, well then they can start treating it right away. Because if you just eliminate phenylalanine from your diet and you have this disorder, you're totally fine. You live just as long as anybody else does. Okay, so we've got two disorders or two different types of ways to inherit things. Autosomal dominant, which you only need one bad copy of the dominant bad gene in order to show it. Um, two dominant will definitely show it and sometimes even to a worse degree. And homozygous recessive is fine. But on the other hand, if you're autosomal recessive, if you have two littles, that's bad. And if you're uh, big big, totally fine. And if you're big small, you're fine. But remember, we call you a carrier because you are carrying that bad gene with you. Okay, so that's it for autosomal dominant recessive. Next up is sex-linked disorders, things that are carried on your X and Y chromosomes. All right, see you later.